Hey, First Baptist Pulaski, this is Eric Clarkson, the pastor of Church in the Village here in Carlisle, Ohio. We miss you guys so much, and we hope everybody's doing safe and everybody is healthy um, down in Pulaski. Your pastors wanted me to just give you a quick video of sharing how the North American Mission Board and the Annie Armstrong offering has affected us as a church here in Carlisle, Ohio. If it wasn't for the North American Mission Board or the Annie Armstrong offering, we wouldn't have had enough funding to start as a church here in Carlisle. So as through your giving and corporately giving at the Southern Baptist Convention, we were able to get some funds to help us start as a church. But that's not the most important thing that the North American Mission Board did for us. They connected us with Sin Cincinnati, which in turn connected us with churches all over the place in the United States and North America. And more importantly, with you guys in First Baptist Pulaski. Because we're a partnership with churches, we were able to, to help create and start new churches all over North America, but also become partners together. So the Annie Armstrong mission offering that we take up this time of year directly affects people like me in my life because we would have never been able to answer the call that God had on our lives financially if it wasn't for the gift of the Annie Armstrong mission offering. So I want to thank you for that, but also want to thank you that, that you guys have decided to partner with us as a church here in Carlisle. And with that, I know your pastors are going to share some exciting news for you here in just a little bit that we're going to partner towards the end of May with another trip here to Carlisle. And I hope you guys can join us. And until we see you guys again, we pray for you weekly in our weekly prayer meeting. We thank God so much for First Baptist Pulaski. We love you guys and we can't wait to see you again you to be a part of that meeting so you can find out more information about how you can partner with us as we go and do mission there in Carlisle, Ohio. Uh, this morning, if you're a guest, we are honored to have you here. Man, I know there's a lot of places you could go and a lot of places you could be this morning, but to be here as we worship the Lord together at First Baptist, to have you here as, as an honored guest is our privilege to host you this morning. So if you would do us a favor, though, out in these glass hallway here, you'll see a, a welcome center or a welcome desk, and you know, there'll be some folks there that can give you a little gift from our church, but also give you more information about how you can partner with us here at First Baptist as we do the kingdom work of God. Uh, Good Friday service, a few announcements for you. Good Friday service is this Friday at 6 p.m. If you'd like to be a part of that, we would love to have you. That will also be streaming online at YouTube. Look for First Baptist Church Pulaski and you can find that. Let people know. Share it on your social media. Tell a friend at work. Invite somebody to be with you as we uh, learn about the sacrifice that Jesus gave us. Uh, also, there's a missions uh, committee team that has met and has decided that we're going to have a garage sale this year, and that's going to be uh, in May at some point, I believe maybe May the 1st. Uh, so plan to be a part of that, whether you give towards that or you have something to donate or you want to help work that, uh, you can see uh, any of the staff and we can and hook you up with those people who are uh, leading that. Also, if you'll look on the back of your bulletin, uh, and this is just a reminder, you'll see there on the, where it says serve others, uh, you'll see where it says pray. And just a reminder that there's things there that we can be praying about, not just on Sunday, but during the week. We can take time, take this bulletin with us and put it on our, uh, our refrigerator and put it on a magnet right there and pray about these things throughout the week uh, so that they can be fresh on your heart and you can be praying for those like Pastor Eric who said he's praying for us. We want to be diligent to also pray for them. Uh, at this time, if everybody would stand, we're going to read God's word. But before we do, if you're a kid in the room, go ahead and go to the back. Miss Haralene is going to lead you guys back for kids' worship this morning. If you want to read along, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And we're going to read a few verses this morning. Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 10. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the prince that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature of wrath, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the, the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of grace, of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We've come to worship him today. I hope that you have taken everything in your life and set it aside for this moment in time because he is worthy of our worship. We're undeserving. We, we don't even deserve to be in this room this morning, but for the mercy and the grace of God, we're here to worship him. So let's bow our heads and let's pray this morning. Lord, we're so unworthy. Lord, as we come before you this morning and we turn our hearts to you, Lord, help us to truly focus in on you this morning. Help us to desire to be in your presence, to walk with you, to talk with you, to live with you every single day. God, we need you. Lord, in the busyness of this life and the craziness of this world, Lord, we should desire daily to walk and breathe and talk and live the way that you would have us. Lord, there's so many people who are lost and who are dying, who are searching Lord, for a Savior, and they don't even know it. Lord, help us to be the lighthouse that they need, Lord, for the gospel to be the changing factor in their life. Lord, I worship you this morning not only because you're worthy of it, because I need it. I need to be in your presence. Lord, use this time Lord, to give you glory and to give you honor. We love you, we thank you, and we worship your holy name this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
Let's pray. Father, we've just sung it in our praying, or praying, pray it in our singing, that uh, you would take our, our wills and our hearts and our minds and transform and conform them to yours. Lord, to set us apart for your glory, your work, your pleasure, Lord. So in these moments now that we're going to spend in your word, we pray that you would grip our hearts and that you would change our minds and that you would reshape our lives in some new fresh way so that others could see the truth of your son Jesus. And we pray these things through him and by your spirit. God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I don't know if you're like me, but that, that first song we sang, the hymn, uh, I'd never sung one of those verses, and I found it interesting and a little bit amusing that I was stumbling on the word intellect. Um, I, don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to read in that. Um, maybe one of you smart people can tell me later uh, why I was stumbling on intellect. Well, Johann Heinrich von Donecker was a German 
sculptor who lived from the mid 1700s to the mid 1800s. And a story is told about him that he took two years to carve an ivory statue of Jesus. Two years to finish this statue. I mean, think about devoting two years of your life to any project like that. It's pretty compelling. And at the end of the two years, he thought, well, I want to see what kind of job I have done. I, I want to see what kind of success this particular sculpture is. And he called in a young girl into his studio and stood her right in front of the statue and said, when you look at this statue, who do you see? And the young girl tilted her head and said, a great man. And the sculptor knew that he had failed. So the young girl leaves and he picks up his chisel the next week and he goes back to work. And over the next six years, he spent time working on this statue of Jesus to bring it more effectively to life. And once again, when he was finished, he invited a, another young child in and stood her in front of the statue and, and said, when you look here, what do you see or who do you see? And she stared intently at the statue and tears began to gather in the bottom of her eyes. And she said, suffer the little children to come to me. And he knew that the statue was finished. The sculptor later shared when people were asking him about those six years, like what motivated you and where did you, how did you put all this together to, to rework the statue and things? And he said, well, Jesus had come and revealed himself to me one night. And I just took what I saw in the revelation of Christ and tried to translate that into the statue. So the vision I had of the Lord is what I tried to bring to life for others to see. It's compelling when we think about what vision, what, what sculpture, what, what are we manifesting of the truth of Christ for others to see. The story goes on, interestingly, that Napoleon Bonaparte actually heard of Doniker's craftsmanship and and approached him and wanted him to, to sculpt a statue of the goddess Venus to be displayed in the Louvre, the, the famous art gallery there in France. And Daniker denied it, denied the request to Napoleon, which, I mean, who says no to Napoleon, right? Who says, who says no to Napoleon? But he, he said no. And the artist is quoting as saying this, quoted as saying this, a man who has seen Christ can never employ his gifts in carving a pagan goddess. My art is henceforth a consecrated thing. That becomes a metaphor for life for many of us. How can we who have seen Christ not set apart, not just our art, not just our mouth, not just our speech, not just our money, but the entirety of our life. How can our life not be set apart for his glory? How is it that we get satisfied with trading in that majesty and, and the mystery of worshiping the living God for other things that are less significant, for things of this world? How is it that we get into that? Well, we're not alone in our struggle. Um, God's people in, in all ages have struggled in this way. And we're, we're talking today about this, this basic idea of consecration, of being set apart for God's purposes, for a special purpose of bringing him glory and advancing his kingdom in and, um, and, and this earth and, and for him transforming lives by the truth of Christ and, and that we're supposed to be a consecrated people. We're supposed to be set aside. We're supposed to be wholly devoted to things not of this world, but, but things of God that are eternal. 
And we've been on this exploration. This is actually our last Sunday in the book of Ezra, but you may remember where it started. God's people were exiled to Babylon because of um, their idolatry, essentially. And we'll loop back into that uh, in today's text. But their idolatry had caused them to, to be banished to Babylon, and then Babylon hands over leadership to, to Persia and various kings, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and Cyrus and Artaxerxes and these people. So uh, these, they get handed over, and then God in his love and in his grace brings them back through a set of pretty amazing circumstances. But So God restores his exiles. And again, we're supposed to see as God's people a parallel between, between the, the captivity in Babylon and him restoring his people to the Holy Land and our captivity, this side of heaven, in, in a pagan world. And that God is going to restore us one day to the promised land, the new heaven and the new earth. Their story is our story. So God restores his exiles. And then we saw that when he delivered them, and, and this is the crazy thing about how um, time and space and all that works with God, is we, those of us in Christ have already been delivered. Read Romans 8.30. Having been called, you were justified. Having been justified, you have been glorified. In the mind of God, we're already delivered. That's just not our experience yet. In the truth of Christ, we've already been delivered. We're robed in his righteousness now and forever. And, and when we, we see that God's brought us out in a way, so now we're kind of already delivered, but not yet fully delivered all of that, we're supposed to be moved by a sense of God's goodness and gratitude uh, should flow from our hearts because of the fact that we've been delivered. And that's what God's children, the Israelites, were feeling as they went back to the promised land. So God's goodness is shown in that deliverance. But then anytime we turn our hearts to true worship, whether it's, whether it's God's people coming out of Babylon or our hearts today in this pagan world, there are going to be forces that try to tie our hands in worship. There, there are going to be spiritual forces that oppose us from wanting to live a consecrated life. Because who gets the glory when we live a set-apart, consecrated, holy life? The living God. So our flesh, you know, in this, uh, in this current environment wants the things and gravitates toward the things of the world until the Holy Spirit of God has just dug us out and poured Christ in and, and done this, this work. But worship of God will be opposed, not just because of our own passions, but also because the spiritual forces that are, are moving and working in this world are trying to suppress the truth of Christ in us and through us. So we saw that worship was going to be opposed, but sometimes God in his grace uses those forces of oppression to bring those blessings. Sometimes that happens in really sneaky ways. And so when God frees us up, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be about his business. So faithfulness for God and to him brings fruitfulness you know, from him, if you will. So faithfulness to God brings fruitfulness for God. And then we find ourselves today in, in the last little section, having surveyed all of that, that in light of all that God has done, in light of all those truths, in light of the fact that that parallel story with Babylon and Israel and the promised land parallels ours from this age moving toward eternity and all of that, what should we be doing? Consecrating ourselves to him. We should be committing ourselves to him. So if you find... Chapter 9, we're going to start right in verse 1 here. So Ezra chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, which says, After these things had been done. So after these things, again, we won't go back through it all, but the second wave of returnees had happened, you know, um, and Ezra was leading this second wave back, and Zerubbabel was involved, and there were lots of things happening. They were rebuilding the temple and, and all that we've discussed. After things had been done, the second wave of returnees um, had come back, and if you look up at chapter 8, verse 35, you see that, um, that they were offering burnt offerings. In verse 36, they were delivering the king's edicts to those local leaders to basically say, hey, we're here on orders of the king, don't, don't mess with us kind of deal. So after these things had been done, the leaders approached me, me as Ezra, the leaders approached me and said, 
the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the surrounding peoples whose detestable practices are like those of, and there are the names, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, Amorites. So you see the people of, of Israel had had recognized, had begun to recognize through their leaders that they had not separated themselves from these idolatrous surrounding nations. So there might be a sensitivity here for us in some ways that says, well, wait a second. How is it that God is saying separate yourself from these people? Because I thought he said, go and make disciples of all nations. How is it that we're supposed to be separate when he said to go and connect with them? He said, you know, go into the highways and byways, the highways and lanes, and make them come in so that my house may be, may be filled. Jesus is telling this parable in Luke 14. How is it that he's getting on to them for being integrated when, and, and he's telling them to be separate when he's actually told us to connect with people who don't yet know him? He says, you know, Jesus says, the, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. They say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus was known to, to have these associations with people, excuse me, who, who weren't of the faith, who didn't acknowledge the living God. Jesus was known to be a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So how is it that, that we're being told here to separate ourselves from the people who need the truth the most. That is a little bit perplexing, but this really isn't just about connecting. It's not about sharing. It's not about associating with. It has to do with our most intimate relationships. And that's, that's the issue here. Separate yourself in, from those most intimate relationships. It says, the one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm in Proverbs 13. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, bad company corrupts good morals. So the more that we, we hang around the people in an intimate way who aren't of this, this faith in the living God, this reliance on what he says to be true, the more our faith and our lives are undermined. That's what this is suggesting. So separate yourselves has not to do with connection or association. It has to do with who you're sharing life with deeply, these surrounding peoples. Adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? James 4. Whew, that's tough to hear. For those places in our lives where we're cozying up to the world, that's, we're sort of at odds with the Lord. Come out of her, my people, so you will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues, Revelation 18, 4. That sounds like a random reference. But if you look in the first part of chapter 18 there, it's talking about Babylon. And Babylon becomes figurative of an anti-God, sort of anti-Christ lifestyle. So come out from that way of thinking like the Babylonians. It becomes symbolic of living a worldly, selfish, pagan, idolatrous life. Come out. Stop doing that. One more for now. Don't be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does God's sanctuary have with idols? For we are the sanctuary of the living God. Now, most of us don't think too clearly about the Holy of Holies and the temple and the sacrifices and all these sorts of things. Let me share an illustration that would be easier for most of us. In my growing up home in East Tennessee, as, as many of you who are a little older like me uh, would understand, there was a room in your house that, that was only used for special occasions. Now, that room for you might be, it might have been the formal dining room or whatever. Ours was a living room. You might have called it a sitting room or the reading room or the parlor or whatever. It just seems like in older families, there was a room that was, you just almost didn't dare go in. Uh, and in our particular family, there was cream colored carpet in there. There's a white piano in there. I mean, it is very much a, you know, don't touch kind of room. 
And if you were invited in there on special occasions, maybe at Christmas time to hear a story or open presents or whatever, that was a room you could kind of go into. Now imagine, if, if you will, if you, trans if you can't relate to that, just transport yourself to my family uh, growing up. Now imagine that the front door opens and I put a board uh, up the step there into the front and I wheel in a wheelbarrow full of, of horse manure. And I truck that horse manure right in the middle of that cream colored carpet and I dump it in the middle of the floor. How well do you think that's gonna be received by, let's call her my mother. How well do you think that's gonna be received? I mean, I saw, as, as I said, wheelbarrow of manure. There are about 10 ladies in here that went, I mean, physically grimaced when I said that, just thinking about that. Okay. What agreement does God's sanctuary have with idols? For we are the sanctuary of the living God. So in some way, when we, we get cozied up with the world, is it not bringing a wheelbarrow of horse manure into the middle of the special place? Isn't that essentially what we're doing? By, by suggesting if we are the temple of the living God, if we have now as God's people, we've replaced the physical building, we are the temple the Holy Spirit has indwelled. It's not a place on a hill in Jerusalem behind a curtain that God manifests his presence on the mercy seat. We are the temple. So if we are that special place, does it make any sense at all that we're gonna truck the world in and dump it in the middle of the temple? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But I hate to confess that with my attitudes and my actions and you know my laziness or, or my anger or my lust or my pride or my whatever it might be, I do that at times. I think like the world thinks sometimes. I feel the way the world wants me to feel because I haven't gotten my due or this didn't go my way or I don't like this or I don't want that or whatever that might be. And we all struggle with this tension. But to willfully truck the, you know, bring the wheelbarrow in should never be. So this idea, these surrounding peoples, I know we're one verse in, it'll pick up speed in a second. Um, these surrounding peoples, it's, it's interesting if you, if you read this list and then you go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, I know some of you are note takers, especially verse 3, you will see that four out of the seven people, out of the people groups listed here, are listed there. So God told them to drive those people out of the land when they were coming in from Egypt, and they didn't do it. They didn't eradicate that sinful sort of association the way God told them. And some of us, even I came to faith when I was eight years old uh, by God's grace. And there, there are things at 51 that are, are not fully eradicated out of my life that I need to work on, that I need to take no prisoners about, that I need to stop making excuses for. Actions, inactions, attitudes, passions, you know, perspectives, whatever it is. There are things that I haven't rooted out the, the ites out of my life, even this far removed from salvation. So, again, for us, exiles from heaven, just like the way it, it related to them, exiles, if you will, from the, you know, the Holy Land coming back, the issue is, is not just about who we share life with the most intimately, like this, this verse has, it's, it's what we value and, and how we engage this world, a world that values things that God doesn't. So it's not just the who in our relationships, bad company, corrupts good morals, companion of fool suffers harm, it's also the what. First John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him or her. You know, sometimes uh, it, those pronouns are convenient. Yeah. Any of us. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does God's will remains forever, abides forever. And what, what is that, what is the first step of abiding forever? Is to confess our sinfulness before God 
Trust the fact that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead and be secured in Christ. Have you placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin? We are about to see a pageant of God's love in his grace Friday night and Sunday, Good Friday and Easter. I, if, you, if you have any doubts about your personal salvation and ready to stand before the Lord, I beg you, would you please open your heart and your mind and your life up to the truth of Christ and pay attention in a different way this Friday and, and next Sunday? Just to, to feel and hear and sense something fresh and new about God's love for you and what he's done for you in Christ. But what idols do we need to drive out of our lives? What, what things does the world say we should value that, that maybe God says are irrelevant? Being well known, being famous. Uh, it's amazing how many of, uh, of our young people these days because of technology think that being famous is something they want to do, be famous. Um, well, if God has it in his will for you to be famous and you want to use your fame for his glory, be famous for him. But is your fame for you or for him? What about money? That's something the world values, of course, that there's nothing wrong with money. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money. It's making money an idol that's the issue. So is it money? Is it fame? Is it booze? Is it leisure? Is it fishing? There are, there are really good things sometimes that be, can become idols, not just the, the nasty things. Fitness can become an idol. Family can become an idol. Dare I say it, Bible studies can replace God in your life. Where it's not about knowing Him, it's about knowing stuff. That's different. That's why I appreciate so much what God's doing with our D groups and our life groups here is we're talking about what it says so we can understand how to, how to apply those principles together. Politics can be, become an idol, whatever. So anyway, the leaders approached Ezra and said, we need to do some stuff here. Look down at verse 2. Indeed, the Israelite men have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons so that the holy seed has become mixed with the surrounding peoples. The leaders and the officials have taken the lead in this unfaithfulness. So now there's confession. Okay, we're seeing it. Now let's admit it. Here's confession. So if you're like me, even as I was talking just now, the Lord's pressing into my life saying, son, there's some things I need you to deal with. So, son, daughter, what do you need to deal with? Confess it. Put a name on it. Admit it. Write it down. You know, something. Confess it. And then notice uh, what happens with, with some good leadership stuff here. Identification. After confession, this was, I was particularly moved by this, studying this this week. The identification. Look at verse 3. When I, Ezra, heard this report, I tore my tunic, that's the undergarment, and the robe, that's the outer garment, pulled out some of the hair from my head and beard and sat down devastated. And when I, you first read that and you think, oh, he's, he's broken for the people he's called to lead. You remember Moses? Lord, why do I have to deal with these people kind of thing? But watch. Verse 4, everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of the unfaithfulness of the exiles while I sat down devastated until the evening offering. At the evening offering, I got up from my humiliation with my tunic and robe torn. It was a, it was a picture of nakedness, which is shame. Then I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to Yahweh my God. And I said, my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift my face toward you, my God, because their iniquities is not what it says. Our iniquities is what it says. He identifies with the sin of his people. Our iniquities are higher than our heads, and our guilt is as high as the heavens. Our guilt has been terrible from the day of our fathers until the present. Because of our iniquities, we have been handed over, along with our kings and priests, to the surrounding kings, and to the sword, captivity, plundering, and open shame, as it is today. Are we broken enough? as people, for our families, our church family, our nation, to say our sin. Not to say 
my mom's sin or my husband's sin or my parents' sin or my church's sin or, you know, those people in my, those other people who have sinned. Are we willing to say our sin? Are we willing to identify with that transgression, to acknowledge before him that I don't have all my stuff together? I'm not, I am not the answer. Jesus is the answer. You are not the answer. Jesus is the answer. And, and there's something really subtle when, when we can sort of distance ourselves and look down at someone else and say, well, she really messed up, or she messed up in such a way that hurt me, or he really messed up and he did these things to me, so I don't have to really talk about my mess because their mess caused my mess. Wait a second, you know? That's, that's not really a, a, a God-honoring way to look at that. And that's what we're seeing here because not only are we sinners, <laughs> just like they are, but if that's true, then there's something about all that that he put us in that situation to become a channel of blessing to them and them to us. So that's the oppressor-blesser thing we talked a little about. And then he begins to, re so after this confession and then identification, now he begins to reflect a little bit. So look at verses 8 and 9. But now for a brief moment, this, I think the reference here is, is the deliverance to the Holy Land. Grace has come from Yahweh our God to preserve a remnant for us and to give us a stake in his holy place. Even in our slavery, God has given us new life and light to our eyes. Though we are slaves, our God has not abandoned us in our slavery. He has extended grace to us in the presence of Persian kings, given us new life so that we can rebuild the house of God and repair its ruins to give us a wall in, Jeru in Judah and Jerusalem. And by the way, Nehemiah, the book, the companion book to Ezra, the next book in the Bible is about the building of the wall around the temple, the building of, you know, the, the fortifications of the city. Ezra is mostly about restoring worship. Nehemiah is about, you know, God's hand in bringing security. So that's, that's a sort of a differentiation there. So this reflection. Let's keep reading in verse, verses 10 and following. Now, our God, what can we say in light of this? For we have abandoned the commands that you gave through your servants, the prophets, saying, the land you are entering to possess, to possess is an impure land. The surrounding peoples have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness, by their impurity and detestable practices. So do not give your daughters to their sons in marriage or take their daughters for your sons. Never seek their peace or prosperity so that you will be strong. Eat the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your sons forever. Never seek their peace or prosperity so you will be strong. How might we be seeking the peace and prosperity of this world? My mind goes back to my first assignment in North Dakota as an Air Force officer. And it was an expectation in those days that every Friday night, right after a close of business, you would be at the officers club. And you had a mug with your name hung on it on the wall. And that you were expected in those days to take that mug up to the counter and get a draft beer. Um, that whole environment was not really about authentic community. It was really about being seen. It was really about the hobnobbing. It was really being seen as a company guy or a company gal so that you were known um, and, and that, that connection and, and all of that sort of stuff all around the whole drinking thing. That's not really my jam. <laughs> That's not really my vibe. Um, but what about your job? I mean, are you on the outside at your job if you're not gossiping? But gossiping really shouldn't be your jam at work. Running other people down? shouldn't be your thing if you're a Christian. It really shouldn't. What about lying about how many hours you actually worked in your week? I mean, everybody's telecommuting now or whatever, right? You're lying about your hours. And we have a friend who's um, doing the telecommuting thing, and basically her boss said, well, you know, just put something down. So you're just going to put something down when you know it's not, those aren't the right hours? 
Because if you, if you don't just put something down or you work really hard while you're, you're telecommuting or whatever, then they look bad, right? Because you're doing more work than them. So they're just saying, don't work so hard, lie on your timesheet, whatever that is. Or do you just go their way and seek the peace and the prosperity that comes from that in your social circles? What about school if you're a student refusing to cheat? I got a great website you can just copy and paste this thing from and whatever else. What about your job? I mean, again, cheating on your job. What about your friend group? If you're a teenager these days, a staggering statistic that... Um, Aaron, our, our former youth pastor, shared is how many inappropriate, how many students, nine out of ten of our own students have exchanged inappropriate physical pictures with other people in student ministry. Not maybe our current student ministry, but when he was here and did the survey, nine out of ten of our kids. So if you're, if you're a student in today's culture and you're exchanging pictures that you shouldn't be exchanging and you say, I'm not going to do that, are you willing to Get away from the peace that comes from being like the rest of the people? Or are you going to stand out? Are you going to take a stand and say, that's not who I am? That's not God's plan for my life or really for your life. And talk to them about Jesus. What about social media for kids or adults? Posting things that make you look sympathetic to the latest cause, be it Democratic cause or Republican cause or the NRA or whatever it is. I mean, you know, just going off. Um, so sometimes we can post things that make us look sympathetic, and sometimes we can not say things so that we look sympathetic. But what's the issue? Well, I'm going to do whatever it takes not to make waves, not to stand out. You know what? Being a Christian in this world, this side of heaven, in Babylon, if you will, you're going to stand out. You're going to stand out. Consecrate yourself. I mean, be about that. We shouldn't just be about not making waves. I mean, we're not trying to stir it up, but take a stand. Risk it. The Lord will bless it. So he reflected on this, and then he turns his, his thoughts to adoration. Verse 13, after all that had happened to us because of our evil deeds and terrible guilt, though you, our God, have punished us less than our sins deserve, might write down Psalm 103, and have allowed us to survive, should we break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit these detestable practices? Lord, you told us to root them out when we came in from Egypt. We didn't do it. Now we've come, gone to Babylon and come back. Are we, should, we, should we just continue to intermarry with them? Wouldn't you become so angry with us that you would destroy us and leave us no survivors, verse 14 says? God, you are right and justified when you hold our sins against us. You remember Psalm 51? against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight so you are right when you pass sentence or judgment you are blameless when you judge me he's right to hold us account to our account but when when we sin we want to deflect and we want to blame other people and we want to make it about them look own your mess I've got to own my junk and own my mess as well I had a conversation with a parent in our church the other day who was talking about and I, and I would tell you who it is, but I didn't get his permission, so I'm going to use he pronouns and stuff. Uh, but he was talking about how uh, his young son was supposed to be taking a nap. And um, instead of taking a nap, his son sneaked out of his room and went to the candy stashes that they had in their house and, and was stealing candy, you know, without permission from the, uh, uh, from the family stash. And when, when this child was caught, you know, and the parents said, hey, you know, what are you doing? Um, don't talk to me about this. Go away. You know, instead of saying, I, I was wrong. Instead of saying, I disobeyed you. Instead of saying, I'm busted. Instead of humbling himself. You know, the young son said, go away. I don't want to talk to you about this. So how many of us right now, since the beginning of our time in God's word today, have felt the pressure from the Holy Spirit and we're saying, go away. I don't want to talk to you about this. And he's saying, look, I see that you're stealing the world's candy. And we're saying, go away. He doesn't want us to go away. I mean, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't want to go away. He, he wants to deal with us. 
Is it the parent's fault when the child makes bad choices to steal candy? Is it the parent's fault when, when discipline is brought? No, that's what love does. Love disciplines. And we see that with a parent and child and candy, but what about God and us and the things of this world? Is it wrong for him to discipline us? We made the choice and we brought it on ourselves. He would be unloving not to discipline us. So right now, he's, I don't know what the progression was in your family, but sometimes the first, the first was a look, and then it maybe is a head shake, and then maybe it was a little pressure on the hand, and then maybe it was a little squeeze on the shoulder, and then it was, okay, when we get home, you, you're going to need to, we got some stuff we got to do. You know, kind of go in your bedroom, and I'm going to calm down before I send you to the afterlife kind of deal. <laughs> but there was like a progression that happened, right? Well, right now, right now, some of us are feeling the pinch or the nudge or the this or the that. Do we want to get where we have to go in, in, out to the woodshed? Would you rather deal with the pressure now or go to the woodshed? Deal with it now. I mean, that's, the Lord is, is pressing in on us. And we get frustrated with him for bringing the discipline? It makes no sense. Oftentimes, it seems like we presume on the grace of our parents. Um, you know, we, we just expect them to be loving and kind and forgiving and this and that, and we can just sort of use them and abuse them. And sometimes we get that way with the Lord. Sometimes we just expect grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Oh, don't keep any, you know, any accounts, Lord. And, and, and in one way, our sin is removed as far as the east is from the west. That's true. That's true. But in another way, he chastens those he loves. So we need to deal with our mess. Romans 6. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. May it never be. May ganoita in Greek. It's kind of just a funny thing. It just sounds weird, so I always remember it. Um, absolutely not. How can we who died to sin, if we place our faith in Christ who's been crucified for our sin and was risen from the dead, how we died to sin in Christ, how can we still live in it? We were buried with him in baptism, I take that to be spirit baptism, not water baptism, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the, by the glory of the Father or to the Father's glory, so we too may walk a new life, new way of life. Shouldn't that be our story? We should be all about that. So he says in verse 15, here we are before you. Though no one can stand in your presence because of this. We need to put away these improper relationships. While Ezra prayed and confessed, weeping and falling, face down before the house of God, an extremely large assembly of Israelite men, women, and children gathered around him. The people also wept bitterly. Then Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, and, um, and Elamite res responded to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women and from sur the surrounding peoples, but there is still hope for Israel in spite of this. Amen. Let us therefore make a covenant before our God to send away all the foreign wives and their children, according to the counsel of my Lord and those who tremble at the command of our God. Let it be done according to the law. A really quick, important biblical principle here is sometimes things in Scripture are prescriptive or descriptive rather than prescriptive. They describe in the progress of God's clarity and revelation. They didn't have the whole Bible. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. So God is doing a, a gradual work here. So he's describing this idea of, well, I need to put away my husband or put away my wife and break this relationship. God hates divorce. If you're married, he wants you to stay married by his grace. Um, there are two pretty clear um, situations that we're told in the New Testament that God allows divorce. The case of adultery, I tell you, whoever divorces his wife, except for the sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. So infidelity, I take this to mean um, that's consummated physically, that's, that's a biblically allowable reason, but even then, try to work it out. Uh, some, this um, sexual immorality is the word porneia, and a lot of people interpret that very broadly. I'm not one of those people that interprets it in this case very broadly, personally. Um, another biblically allowable reason is abandonment by a non-believer. If the unbeliever leaves, let him, let her leave. For you, wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Or you, husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? If a non-believer sees the love of a believer, then he or she might be drawn to the truth of God's love in Christ. So, as God leads, 
stay married. As God empowers, stay married. We're in a covenant and we need to keep it. Uh, all right, continuing, verse, verse 6. I told the worship team, I'm going to finish early. Huh. Um, verse 6, um, Ezra then went from the house of God and walked to the chamber of Jehonon, the son of Eliashab, where he spent the night. He did not eat food or drink or water because he was mourning over the unfaithfulness of the exiles, himself included. He was broken about it. I mentioned last week that this coming Friday, might be a good opportunity for some of us to practice fasting. Um, it's not something that a lot of us do. To abstain from something, chocolate, uh, food, dessert, TV, whatever. Fast from something. And every time you feel that urge, whatever that urge is, be reminded to pray. Pray for your own sin. Pray for the sin of our church family, the sin of our nation. Pray for the loss that you, you know, are connected to, whatever. But this is... This burden should move us to do things like verse 8 says. Verse 9, so all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered in Jerusalem within three days. On the 20th day of the ninth month, and all the people sat in the square at the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have been unfaithful by marrying foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Therefore, make a confession to Yahweh, the God of your fathers, and do his will. What a great sort of message for us today. Make a confession before God and do His will. Make this confession. Do His will. Reflect on who He is and what He's done, especially in Christ, and that should motivate us. Verse 12, and all the assembly responded with a loud voice, yes, we will do as you say. But there are many people, and it's a rainy season. We don't have the stamina to stay out in the open. This isn't something that can be done in a day or two, for we have rebelled terribly in this matter. Get this. Now imagine First Baptist Pulaski saying this, if we have issues in our church family. Let our leaders represent the entire assembly. Then let all those gathered in our towns who have married foreign women come at appointed times, basically for inspection, together with the elders and judges of each town in order to avert the fierce anger of God concerning this matter. Only Jonathan, son of Ashiel, and Jeziah, son of Tikva, oppose this. Da -da 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 -da. So... Verse 16, the, the exiles did what had been proposed, and Ezra the priest selected men who were family leaders, all identified by name, to represent their ancestral houses. They convened on the first day of the tenth month to investigate the matter. So this took three months to do, to go through all of the households there in, in, the, you know, in the Holy Land and, and root out who had married foreign wives and all this. They convened on the first day of the tenth month to investigate the matter, and by the first day of the first month they had dealt with all the men who had married foreign women. And if you read down through that list, there were 110 men listed here, 17 priests, 10 Levites, 83 laymen. Can you imagine if we got that serious about um, being holy that I said, why don't you come to my house and ask me some questions? See how my marriage is, is going, or how my family's doing, just ask me questions, whatever you feel led to ask so that I can see how I need to repent and respond to the Lord. Y'all come on over and ask, ask some questions. And you said, why don't you come over and sit down with our family? You know, maybe bring one of the other pastors or the deacon, you know, another deacon with you. So just come down and sit down and ask us some questions. And you know, in the brethren tradition of the faith, it is customary, and the churches tend to be smaller, but it's customary in, in a lot of brethren churches that... Um, the pastor or some of these designated representatives will come to your house before the Lord's Supper and ask you if you're in fellowship with the Lord before they'll serve you the Lord's Supper. I mean, that's, that's next level stuff. We're not going to get there. I'm not saying that. But my point is, they were by this point, they were pretty serious about responding to what the Lord was saying. And notice verse 44. All of these had married foreign women, and some of the wives had given birth to the children. Now imagine after all those visits... All those names were there, and we, we put a bulletin board up at the church and said, in all these home visits, we discovered this, and like listed them on a bulletin board in the hallway. That'd be, that'd be something. That'd be something, for sure. I'm not ready for that any more than you are. Um, but the point is, when we reflect on the goodness of God and, and we identify, you know, those things, we confess them, we want to deal with them, it should drive us to want to consecrate ourselves, to commit ourselves, to be set apart for him, to be about a holy life, to do whatever is necessary 
to rid ourselves of these attachments to the world that are holding us back in our, in our, our Christian race. So what is it? Or what are those things? Who are those people that are holding you back in your walk? What are those habits? What are those attachments? And God is saying, consecrate yourself, separate yourself. And do you remember, of course, what he, what he said, you know, what Daniker said, the, the sculptor, when we started? A man who has seen Christ can never employ his gifts in carving something pagan. So have we seen something of the truth of Christ today? And are we going to go out and carve something pagan? Or are we going to be, you know, transfixed? And, you know, that two-year statue wasn't good enough, and we're going to double down, and it's going to be six? And, of course, the question of, might arise, have you ever seen Christ? Not the statue, but the love of God in him for you. And I mentioned Good Friday and, and uh, Easter's coming, and this would be a great time to maybe open your heart and mind and life up to the truth of who he is. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and help us um, with a time of reflection and response. If you're able and don't mind, um, please stand and, and uh, I'll pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we continue to be blown away about who you are as we've seen in your word today. Um, Lord, these Old Testament accounts seems so relevant and so present for us today. Lord, I, I pray that in your love and in your grace, you would not let us wiggle out from under the, the gentle pressure that your Holy Spirit has been putting on each of us and that we would respond in some way. Lord, we open up the altar, of course, for prayer for ourselves, for those we love, those who are not yet of the faith. Lord, for our church family, our, our marriages, Lord, our nation. So, Lord, we want to pray about those things. But, Lord, maybe somebody has a decision that um, he or she needs to announce to the church. We look forward to hearing that. But, Lord, help us enter in, even in this, uh, this song, to a time of reflection that is pleasing to you. We give it to you through Christ.
church, that is God's heart that we come as we are. And we need to know that we're welcome, but he's not going to leave us there. He's going to transform us. So we leave change. So yes, come as you are, but leave change. And I hope that's the, the case for all of us today, that uh, we have been in some measure changed into the likeness of Christ. Uh, a couple of quick announcements before we finish up here. The, the missions committee met, as I think Brother Andrew might have mentioned, about the uh, garage sale. So look forward to that May 1st. This, this coming Friday night, 6 o'clock, and then we're still trying to figure out whether or not we would go back to or stay two services into the summer when we tend to go back to one uh, service for the summer or we're just going to go immediately back to one. I think uh, when I say one service, I mean worship service. So the current thinking is that after Easter, we would go back to the one service thing. So next week is about giving us space, um, you know, for more people and for distancing with all the COVID concerns. So anyway, just Pray for our wisdom in that, and we will uh, trust Him for it together. But we look forward to being with you on a on a special week when we uh, we're not we're not really good about liturgical tradition, so we forgot we were supposed to put the purple drape up before now. So, we, but we will still change it from purple to white uh, this next Sunday, so we can look forward to that. I'm going to ask Dustin if he doesn't mind to come up and close us in prayer. Uh, but thank you all so much for. Um, you know, swimming in like ducks this morning and, uh, and just worshiping. Uh, what a blessing. And those of you at home, we love you and we miss you, and we can't wait to see you in person. Let's pray. God, we come before you broken, knowing of our own unfaithfulness. But God, as the song we just sang says, we come to you as we are in that brokenness, in that unfaithfulness, asking that you would consecrate us. God, holiness, righteousness, faithfulness is what we yearn for. And it is only through your Son and by the power of your Spirit that we can have those things. And so we pray right now that you would give that to us, that we might be your light into the world. God, let us shine your light before a broken and dark world that needs to know you. So as we go out from here, God, let us share the love of Christ with those who need to hear it. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.